we are going to come back together. One of the litmus tests that I have for spiritual maturity is people's ability to laugh. If you're able to laugh, I think that you show that you're a little bit more spiritually mature because you don't take life so seriously. Some of the greatest sages and wise people that I know are able to laugh at themselves and at the world and even in the face of the most difficult situations. I love this idea that spirit, you cannot, your spiritual maturity cannot outpace your emotional maturity. And I think when you are emotionally mature, you have the capacity to laugh at things. And so today, we're going to talk about laughter. But if we're going to talk about laughter and the practice of laughter, we're going to talk about some things. We're going to talk about spiritual maturity. If we can do that, then we can talk about our ego. If we can talk about our ego, then we can talk about the neuroscience of laughter, talk about a good time on a Sunday morning. If we can talk about the neuroscience of laughter, then we can talk about our limitations. If we can talk about our limitations, then maybe we'll have the ability to laugh at ourselves. If you can laugh at yourself, then humus, not hummus, but we'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> and if humus, then we can talk about life, and if we can talk about life, then we'll have a little story about Belfast, Ireland. Sound good, my friends? All righty. If Jesus, nope, already got this wrong. If Mary is the mother of Jesus, and if Jesus is the Lamb of God, then Mary had a little lamb. <laughs> I'm going to be here all morning, people. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I've been working on that one for a while. Really, I just stole it off of TikTok and needed to stick that in there. Laughter is just a gift for the soul. Laughter is something that changes and transforms who we are, and laughter is something that kids just do naturally. They don't have to be coaxed into laughter. They don't have to be forced into laughter. They just find things funny. What I love about kids is that they only just, don't only just participate in laughter. They participate in their emotions. They're able just to cry. Kids are able just to be curious and ask questions. And I think as adults, sometimes we lose our ability to do those things because we have so many layers going on within us. Jesus was very aware of this, so follow along with me in Matthew chapter 19. I'm just getting them back there today. Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them, because you got to imagine that Jesus was going around, and everybody knew that this Jesus was a holy man, he was a sage, he was something, something was going on with this guy, and if you thought that something was going on with this guy, you would want his blessing too for your child. So all of the people were out in the town and they knew that Jesus was there and they brought their children to him so that Jesus would lay his hands on them and provide a blessing or a prayer or care for who their child was. But then you would know that that's normal if you're a parent that you would want these things. But then it says, but the disciples rebuked them. Because sometimes even the people that follow Jesus are not quite mature yet. The people that were closest to Jesus, they were so serious. This is the son of man or the son of God. And what if these kids are crying here or make noise in church or whatever the thing is? But Jesus was keenly aware that there was something more important going on here than if kids were going to get in the way. I think about this. There's a bunch of people coming to see Jesus and I have kids. I cannot imagine that there's this really beautiful moment in which my kids are going to see the Lord. Right? Right? And what would my kids be doing? They would probably be punching each other or yelling at each other or getting in a fight and I would be highly embarrassed and I would get triggered and something would go on and I can just imagine what's going on in the crowd because that's normal because kids are just freely living in the moment. And then Jesus goes on and Jesus says, Jesus said, let the little, little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I think what Jesus is getting to is that there's a greater reality out there. Most of us don't use language like the kingdom of heaven, but we would for sure like to have a greater reality. We would like to have a greater perspective about what it means to be human. And Jesus points to children because every great spiritual leader takes us on the same path. That we go through the simplicity of life, 
And then we get into the complexity of what it means to be an adult, and you go through all of your things and all of your figuring it out, and you all have your unique family trauma and your unique pains and the unique things that happen to you, and life becomes complex, and that person said that thing to you in seventh grade, thanks, Sarah, right? You just have these different things that have taken place in your life. And it's shaped who you are and how you see yourself and what your body image is and that thing that your dad did to you at that time. And that's just what it means to be human. And as a kid, you don't have any of those things to start off with, but you begin to collect those things as you get older. Different layers that you put on yourself and you're uncertain of who you are and unsure of who you are. And sometimes you're uncertain of how you see reality. And then what Jesus takes us on is the path of safety and healing and transformation and maturity where we begin to let go of our ego we begin to let go of those layers and all of the filters that shape the way that we see the world. And what we get back to is simplicity on the other side of things again. We're back over here. We're reminded again of who we really are. We're able to laugh again. We're able to question again. We're able to be curious again and experience our emotions again. And there's just this process of figuring things out. That when Jesus says that, these, that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, Jesus is saying to all of us, I want to get you back over here because this life is incredible. This life is filled with wonder and awe and magic and it's all right there in front of you. But sometimes as a human being, life just beats it out of you in a different way. And what if you could pick this up over here again? What if Christmas morning could be Christmas morning again? What if there could just be magic when you hear a fire truck in the road? What if there could just be excitement when somebody runs up to you and gives you a hug? What if you could just experience the richness and rawness of life? What if you could just laugh? I love laughing, by the way. Like, I am obsessed with going to stand-up comedians. And I like stand-up comedians to be ridiculous, to say wild things, because I think that the world is wildly serious right now. I think the world is widely div wildly divided. And I love going to stand-up comics just poke holes at everything. In some ways, they're better preachers and prophets than we are in the church. Because they can say things that we wouldn't dare to say. And they're challenging our assumptions as society and as human beings and what we value. And we need those things. And they're disarming us because they're just making us laugh. And we know that when we just laugh, our guard goes down. We've all been there in an argument. But we're so certain that we are right. We we're so frustrated at this person. You're all tensed up. And it doesn't matter what's going on right now. But when you get tense like that, we even know that our view and our perspective of reality begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And we're just right here. If you all just do this with me, clench your fists and shrug your shoulders and just feel and squeeze that. You know what that feels like inside your being. I just kind of put your palms open and just give a big exhale. That feels better. And we automatically just do that when we experience laughter, when it just hits us out of nowhere, when we can laugh at the world and the goodness that's all around us. I love my kids because they make me laugh all of the time. They just say wild things. I have the luxury of coaching little kids baseball. We had a game last night at 7 p.m. I was completely exhausted. It's a bunch of 10-year-olds. They're absolutely maniacs. But they just made me laugh the entire time. They were just wild. And they're just giddy. And at one point, I was a little frustrated at one of them. An 11-year-old said to me, well, coach, this is on you because you chose to coach some 11-year-olds. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> this is on me. Thank you for teaching me that I can still laugh. How am I, a dad of 38 years old, frustrated that a kid missed a pop fly? That's on me. That's not on you. We get so worked up about the world, but it's on us sometimes. And we just have the ability to laugh or take it a little bit lighter. I think one of the ways that we can practice laughter and bring it into our lives is that we can laugh at our limitations. Here's the deal as a human being. You have limitations. Somebody can jump higher than you. They're faster than you. They're smarter than you. They might be better at work than you. Something is just different than who you are. We all have a story of limitations of how things haven't worked out or how things have gone better over there. And I think when we begin to accept that as human beings, then we'll just be a little kinder to each other. 
Sometimes we live in a world of limitations where we love to play oppression Olympics. Well, you have more limitations because you have this going on, this going on, this going on, and this person over here maybe only has this going on, this going on, this going on, as if you know what's going on inside somebody's life or what they have going on. Instead of playing those games of who's suffering more or who has things more difficult or what limitations they have, maybe we can accept the reality that we all have limitations. And when we can accept that, maybe it makes us a little bit lighter in the world. If I know the limitations that I have, if I know the way that I see the world because of my mommy issues, that's not a joke, by the way, because of my things going on, because of my pain, because of my hurt, because of that time that my sister did that thing to me, whatever the thing may be, then I can have a little bit of grace for what you got going on. I can say, oh, you got your whole set of stuff. But the moment that I can begin to accept my reality, then I can accept your reality, then maybe we can take things a little bit lighter. Because this is our chance. And we have a choice in this world. We can be mad about 11-year-old missing pop flies, or we can accept the reality, I chose to do this. This is where I'm at. And that these kids get to remind me of something so much bigger than myself. And we all have a choice to be reminded of limitations in a different way. Here's another choice that we have, is that when we're reminded of our limitations, we're also reminded that we have everything that we need to make ourselves happy. How do I know that? All of the chemicals that you need for happiness are already in your brain. Endorphins, oxycotins, right, dopamines, they're in our brain. And we know that when we choose, and I use the word choose very, very carefully, when we choose to stay angry, be frustrated, be mad, live in that world, it literally stresses out our bodies. When we choose it, to hold all of those things, it literally creates more heart disease. When we choose to hold these things, we know the statistics on cancer. When we choose to make the world stressful and serious all of the time, it affects us. When we choose to exhale, and let go, to accept, to breathe, to open up. We know that our body has wild effects. We know that if you just do laughter, be something that's incredibly hard. If you do laughter right before like running a marathon or doing something that's stressful, you will be able to endure pain by 15% more than if you didn't laugh. Simple, where was that magical drug? In your brain. That we know that if you are going through stressful situations with body health, that if you choose lightness and happiness and choose to laugh at the situation in some way, even if you fake it until you make it, we know the advanced science and the neuroscience of what that does to your mental health and how you can endure things. That so much of life and laughter and happiness and joy is a choice that we participate in. That life comes at us, there's no doubt about that, but there's a reason that the people that have endured so much in this world, they constantly had the ability for laughter. Martin Luther King Jr., Archbishop Desmond Tutu, that these are people who endured horrific things in the world, and what everyone says around them is that they were able to come into a room and they were able to laugh because they knew that one of the most disarming things we can do as a human being is just to make light of something, even in the face of the most horrific odds. And that that is not something that you just do. That is something that you practice. So if you wanna practice laughing at things, let's start with just laughing at yourself. When we laugh at ourself and what we have going on, we just have a, an incredible ability to have resiliency in a different way that we don't have in other ways. And here's the deal. I take myself seriously all the time, and I'm trying to get better at it. My eight-year-old the other day, he was having a complete tantrum, and he was having a fit, and he was saying some mean words to us, and in the middle of his tantrum and fit, he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Like, he caught himself emotionally there. And then he made a joke about something, that he had the emotional intelligence to stop his fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, his rage and his limbic system right there, and to step outside of it for a moment and say, Oh, wow, I crossed the line there. That was pretty wild, right, Dad? Yeah, he went back to it, but he stepped out of it for a second because we have the ability to do that. We have the ability to laugh at ourselves, and that's a practice. The next time that you're in that conversation with somebody and you feel yourself being so serious and so right and so certain, just take an opportunity to laugh at yourself. To maybe giggle about who you are and what you got going on right now. The next time, have you ever been at a party and you were talking about something and you come home and you're like reviewing that conversation in your head that you felt embarrassed? Have you ever said something at work 
And you're like, oh, I can't believe I said that out loud. And you're just reviewing and playing that tape over and over and over. Have you ever just had the embarrassing thing happen to you where things didn't work out for you and everybody saw it and you made a fool of yourself? And you just want to make yourself smaller and more fragile in that moment. Well, what if we practice just laughing at ourselves in some way? One of the things that I love about kids is they remind us of the truths of just who we are as human beings. One of those things that I've been reminded as as I just get a little bit older is that kids remind me of some fun stuff about life, including this reality. As human beings, we all poop ourselves sometimes. A couple years ago, I was in Orange County with a buddy, and I was going to a meeting. And some of you have heard this story before, but I'm going to tell you it again because it's a reminder of that we have a choice to laugh at ourselves or just an opportunity to be horrified. I was going to a meeting in South Orange County. And in South Orange County, I was going to this meeting for a different business deal, and I was going to a golf course. And because I was going to that golf course, I had to wear a very specific set of golf clothes because I was going to a golf course. That tea time was at 11 a.m., so before that, I met another buddy at a restaurant to go to breakfast that morning before I went to the golf course. I was meeting with one of my friends. They only get to see like twice a year, and we're having a really meaningful conversation. After breakfast that morning, my friend says, hey, do you want to go walk around outside because you have a little bit of time to kill, and let's just chat about life and the things that are going on. We're walking outside, and because we're outside, and because there's open air, and because there's traffic, I did what any adult human being would do after they've eaten too much breakfast and feel a little bit gaseous. You decide just to have a small fart that no one will hear. (laughs) And so I'm sitting there, standing on the corner. I'll always remember this corner and exactly where I was at, (laughs) because I did something that we all do. We trusted ourselves for a moment. You trusted yourselves for a moment because you have trusted yourselves in this situation many a times. You know that feeling in your stomach. I need to get it out a little bit, but I don't want anybody to hear. And if I walk a little bit, maybe the smell will go away. You know all of the calculations you do in your head. Because there's nothing that you can do about this reality. Your stomach is just gurgling and it hurts and you're just trying to find a way. So in that moment, I trusted myself in the same way that I've trusted myself for 36 years of my life at that point. And I just had a little one that went out. And immediately I knew something went very, very wrong here. (laughs) And I look at my friend who I've known for 20 years and I said, it's so good to see you, I have to go now. (laughs) And he looks at me shockingly and I go as fast as I can. I go back into the very same restaurant that we're in, the bathroom which I was familiar with because before I had to use the restroom. And I knew in this bathroom I was going to be set with a dilemma because in this bathroom there's one urinal and one stall and everybody walks into the same thing. And so I knew that somebody else could enter the bathroom at any time. And so I go into this bathroom and I lock that stall and I, you know, have to see what happened here. (laughs) Have any of you seen CSI? (laughs) It was horrific. It was scary. And I had two things going on. One is, how am I going to get to my next meeting? Because it's a very important business meeting. And two was a deep emotional reality that I had to analyze with my therapist. I can no longer trust myself. (laughs) You told me that this would be okay, buddy, and it's not okay. We are in a predicament. And so I have to take off all of my boxers and clean up the mess. And I have to, like, use all of the toilet paper in there. And then I realized, though, it has not just been in my boxers. My pants are soaked. And I have to go get into a car. And I have to find a solution because I cannot miss my next meeting. So I took all of the toilet seat covers that were in that place. And I padded my vehicle with them (laughs) so that it would be sanitary. And I Googled for the nearest Dick's Sporting Goods because I not only needed any clothes, I needed a very specific set of clothes because I still had to make golf. So I go in Dick's Sporting Goods, smelling horribly, praying to God that nobody is in there, purchasing my item, trying to make distance from every other person. And I asked the woman, this is a strange request, but I need to put these clothes on right now. And she said, not a problem. You can go use the bathroom. And thankfully, praise God for the little miracles in life, there was a lock on that door. And I (laughs) bathed in that sink. (laughs) Bathed. And I got to my tea time two minutes late, And I had to look him in the eye, and it was a moment of just pure horror or a moment of laughing at myself. I said, Tom, I'm sorry I'm late. I pooped myself. (laughs) And he said, that's TMI. I'm just glad that you got here. (laughs) 
But he had to make the choice because I couldn't risk being next to this man in a golf cart for the next four hours. And you know that smell where you're just kind of through like, I just tried to make sure nothing was going on. Life happens sometimes. Life's difficult sometimes. It's uncomfortable and we have a choice. It's one of those things, you can have a story where you poop your pants and you're horrified of it and you don't want to tell anybody of it or you can take an opportunity to go laugh at what happened there. And there's other serious things that take place in life and we have the opportunity to laugh. And what I love about kids is that's what they do all of the time. They don't take themselves so seriously. We know as adults that our limbic system puts us into fight, flight, or freeze when we are in conflict. That fight, flight, or freeze is a reaction to all of the other trauma that we have gone through before. But we can change our limbic system. We also have the ability to offer new things to our brain when we go through something that is uncomfortable, unknown, or uncertain. We can teach our brain to be curious. We can teach our brain to self-soothe. We can teach our brain to laugh. The beauty of that, I think what Jesus knows, is there's a different reality out there for all of us. We may be operating out of one system, but the good news of this radical other kingdom that Jesus constantly talks about is there's a different way to live out life. So if we can laugh at our limitations, and if we can laugh at ourselves, then I think that we have the ability to laugh at life. Here's what I know about life. It's gonna be good, it's gonna be beautiful, it's gonna be wonderful, and it's gonna be filled with suffering, and loss, and grief, and difficulty, and betrayal, and trauma, and pain. It's all of the above, because it's life. And when we have the ability to begin to laugh at ourselves, and sometimes we have the ability to laugh at life. Because have you ever been in just like a super serious conversation with somebody where everything is going wrong, but you know some of the things that they're saying are just wild, like and they don't add up? There's a story of a famous spiritual leader who went to Belfast, Ireland because he was invited by the Catholics and the Protestants for all of the struggle that was going on there. And somebody stood up on both sides and both sides said, I'm so committed to my position about being Catholic or I'm so committed to my position about being Protestant because Jesus would want me to kill you. And this spiritual leader began laughing out loud in front of a thousand people about how ridiculous those statements were. And it was his laughter and levity that began to heal the room. Because people had been going through challenges and suffering in their life for so long that they begin to buy their own lies. And how many of us are just guilty of that as human beings? We've just told ourselves the narrative again and again and again that we begin to co-sign on our own BS. And sometimes what we need is just someone to break the spell. And this spiritual leader in that moment broke the spell for them broke the spell that what they were saying was so absolutely ridiculous to the person that they're talking about in Jesus. That sometimes if they would just take a moment to step back and have a little bit of levity, they might see their fellow human being in a different way. And that brings me to the word humus. In the word for humility, and in the word for humanity, right, it is the same word of humus. It's the same word for humor. It's the root word for all of these things. That when we have enough humility to laugh at ourselves, it makes space to realize and share in everyone else's humanity as well. That when we have the ability to laugh at ourselves and to laugh at life, I think what it does is it changes the questions that we begin to ask ourselves all the time, which this is a common one. Why me? To a, changes the conversation to, if I'm going through something, then you're probably going through something as well. And if I have enough humility to realize that, if I can embrace some humor in it, then I can embrace the humanity that we all share. And then I want you to see the world in a self-centric way of why me, but I'll begin to quickly realize, oh, you too. You too. I have no idea what that's like. I can't imagine how painful that was. Man. I never knew that that was even a thing in the world. And when we can do that, then I think that we have the ability to live in a very different way as human beings. Children do this so naturally. They don't need to be taught it. In a lot of ways, we're the ones that add layers on them that begin to tell them that they can't laugh whenever. Not in church. You can't cry whenever. We don't cry here. 
that they can't be curious at those kind of questions. Oh, we want to ask that. God doesn't want to know that. But they're just doing it because it's natural to them. And as we mature and as we grow up, one day we'll come back on the other side of things and we'll be able to laugh again. And we'll be able to cry again. And we'll be able to be curious again. And that gift is a gift that we share as human beings with one another. Would you find those same three or four people around you and would you ask this question, answer this question with one another? It's coming. At least we're consistent. You guys are good today. How can you practice laughter and joy?